Uh, well, I'm really excited to uh, to have Matt uh, Matthew Johnson from Kingset Capital join me on this call. Uh, Kingset was founded in 2002, uh, and since then they've raised 12 billion dollars of equity for their various funds. Uh, this channel is about industrial real estate, and they're major players in that space. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, to this chat. Uh, thanks for joining me on this call, Matthew. Thanks, Chad. Uh, so before we do a deeper dive, I just kind of want to get a high level uh, uh, thoughts from you on industrial real estate. Uh, I, I guess what what do you find attractive about industrial real estate as an investment? Sure. Um, I've been in industrial real estate since I got into the commercial real estate business in 2005 um, when I first joined with Summit REIT. And what I've, what I've always loved about industrial real estate through my career is the is the resiliency of the asset class as well as the uh, flexibility of the asset class and, and what i mean by flexibility is you know in, in most asset classes there's a fairly specific thing that happens within the four walls uh you know when it comes to multifamily, it's for people to to live in uh when it comes to office for people to work in and when you get into industrial it becomes a little more blurred and that's where a lot of the opportunities lie uh, there's a lot of different things you can do within the four walls of an industrial box from manufacturing to distribution, you can do office uses, uh, you can do retail type uses, the, the box itself is, is very flexible, um, which, which gives it the resiliency, uh, as I mentioned before, in a, in a changing environment. So, you know, having, having something that has that many uses available to it just means that you have a wider range of, of um, potential tenants and, and better lease and liquidity. So, having that coupled with the fact that, you know, in my opinion, industrial real estate is, you know, starting to come into its own at this point, And we're starting to see a lot more um, macro economic changes or societal changes that are, are starting to really push industrial to the forefront. Yeah, what's well, really interesting, I was just reading that study that uh, Narit put out uh, in the US, uh, when they looked at all the different asset classes for REITs in 2020. Uh, residential was down, retail was down, office was down, but industrial, the industrial REIT sector uh, was up 12.17% last year. So it, it, you're right, it, it really is that resilient asset class that other asset classes certainly struggled in 2020, but industrial did quite well. Uh, how did you see things over this past year that we were forced to have this massive change thrust upon us? How, how did you see this past year for industrial real estate? Yeah, I think this was really the year where industrial showed what it can do in, in these uh, challenging times. Um, you know, the COVID pandemic crisis, uh, you know, changed a lot of things about how we live our day-to-day -day lives. Um, you know, certain things didn't change. People continue to live in homes. Uh, however, there is, there's ways you can change your living arrangements by doubling up or moving back home or whatever the case may be. So there's certainly, you know, some noise in the, in the multifamily sector. Uh, office obviously being shut down and retail being shut down were the reasons for you know, some of the challenges those asset classes had. But with industrial, a lot of the things we were starting to see come to the forefront in, in the changes in society were you know, put into hyperdrive when it came to the pandemic. And really that's e-commerce and the move away from traditional bricks and mortar shopping to more you know, um, uh, e-commerce shopping, obviously, or, or online shopping. And, and this is, you know, has been a slow slowly growing, particularly in Canada, slowly growing uh, segment that's really been given a boost uh, through this. And it, to me, it's, it's, it's about people didn't, aren't buying fewer things and they're buying the same number of stuff, uh, same amount of stuff. It's just where it's coming from and where it's housed along the way. Uh, and traditionally it came through a warehouse where it quickly went to a, you know, a retail um, store where we acted as both a re, uh, warehouse and a retail outlet. Uh, now you're since you're losing that retail for a lot of for a lot of uh, items, you're not going to the retail side. It's going straight to the consumer. It's just changed dramatically the 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 amount of industrial and the amount of of good quality industrial that's required to to fulfill that um, that need. So you know, I think what we've seen is there's been a, a number of, of of things, including um, you know a, a shift from just in time uh, production on the manufacturing side. If we if we shift from from distribution to manufacturing, what we've seen is you know, the, our supply chains have become very long and a little bit fragile. And the pandemic really revealed some of the weaknesses in the supply chain. And everybody's experienced that where we've seen you know uh, certain products not available at certain times. And this is a result of 
people or companies making a conscious decision not to keep a supply or a store of inventory on site because that's costly and having it arrive just in time. And I think we're soon going to see a need to move more towards a just in case type mm -hmm. of model where people say, yes, our supply chain works now, but in the event something happens, a black swan event happens, we want to be sure that we're seamless and able to continue to um, you know, provide our services or our products that, uh, that people are, are buying. Um, and I think that even goes doubly for, uh, you know, the pandemic really revealed the lack of PPE, for example, in, in Canada, the fact that it took us a long time and we were reliant on, you know, the United States to get our N95 masks. I think what we'll see going forward and what we're starting to see is we need to have a lot of this stuff here just in case. Uh, and that requires warehousing that requires industrial real estate. So it's, it's been a real, I think it's been a real eye opener for a lot of companies and a lot of people that the, the importance of having good quality, accessible uh, real estate, that's uh, industrial real estate uh, in your supply chain and in, in your overall business model is, is critical. You touched on a couple of really good points there, and I, and I want to explore that uh, a little bit more, just deviating from some of the questions that uh, you and I discussed already, uh, but to unpack the difference between warehousing and manufacturing, because uh, I've talked a lot about that, that industrial of, often gets grouped as just one big asset class, but there really is a distinct difference between manufacturing and warehousing. And a lot of what was in the news last year was on that warehousing front with e-commerce and and people ramping up their inventory and requiring the warehouse. How do you analyze deals when you're looking at the difference between a manufacturing property and a warehousing property? I think it really just comes down to the fundamentals around the property itself, the attributes of the, of the property. Uh, you know, Traditionally, in the past, a manufacturing facility was built very specifically to the manufacturer's requirements. Um, and, and that meant quite often lower clear heights, it meant fewer shipping doors, maybe deeper depths. And these things didn't translate well into distribution and, and warehousing. I think what we've seen is a move away from highly specialized buildings towards more generic buildings. Uh, you can certainly carry out a manufacturing process within the four walls of a distribution facility. It might not have, you know, if your requirement is only for 12 foot clear height, you can still operate under 30 foot clear height. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe you don't want to heat all that extra space, but you can do the operation. The reverse is not true. You, you, you simply can't economically and feasibly distribute, you know, high volumes of a filament center out of a 12 or 14 clear height building. Um, so what I think we're seeing is, is a, a movement away from the specialization, except for certain very highly specialized uh, uses where there's certain things that you absolutely have to build within it, whether it be, you know, some like super high clear height for a small section to do, you know, stamping or something on those lines. Um, or, or, you know, thicker floors or these kinds of things. But for the most part, all that stuff is translatable to any use. Um, you know, one of the big things in manufacturing versus, uh, versus warehousing is the amount of power. And uh, manufacturing facilities obviously require a lot more power. But we're even seeing now that there's other uses that, you know, having the extra power is not a detriment. You know, you might not use it all, but having it there is, is not a bad thing. So, I think what we're, we're really seeing the evolution of industrial away from its specialization and more towards a more generic asset class. Yeah. And like you said, there's, there'll be those unique cases where a build to suit is required. If a manufacturer has very customized requirements, that will probably need a build to suit. But uh, you're suggesting that from spec build, like the new inventory coming on where there isn't necessarily a tenant, there'll be more multi-purpose so, so that it could fit both warehousing and manufacturing tenants, depending on who comes to the door. Right. Yeah. I don't think anybody would speculate on building a, a manufacturer because you, you're guessing as to what those requirements would be. Um, however, like, like I was saying before, you can still work with a manufacturing tenant who says, I need these things. You say, well, we can recreate that within the four walls. It's almost like a building within a building. And, and you've seen that in the cold storage uh, sector where you could take a ambient building and you could build a freezer within it. Uh, once again, you need the power, obviously. Um, but there's nothing else you actually require to, to do that. Typically, we build cold storage facilities now with the cold storage attributes built into the building itself, um, but that's not required that you have to have that. So we certainly uh, will find even, even in the build to suits, I think landlords will look and say, I'm fine with your specialization, but I want to do it within a more generic box. In the event you're not here at the end of your term or something happens to you, I don't want to have to tear the thing down. I'd rather be able to turn around and 
remove your trade fixtures or, or whatever specialization you've done within the box and lease it to you know, any number of potential tenants. That's a really good point because it, it could cost more money up front if you if you have a tenant that needs a manufacturing requirement to to build it to a higher standard so that it could work for future tenants down the road that costs more up front but the long term gain of that like you say is if that manufacturing tenant leaves you can always backfill that with any number of industrial tenants instead of being pinholed into that one specific type that, that, that's a really good point on that. Uh, and, and I'm sure you get a ton of deals across your desk all the time. There's people probably sending you deals all, all across uh, Canada. Uh, when you're looking at deals, is there an order and how you start filtering them through? Because I'm sure you, you, you look at some deals really quickly and it's either, yes, we'll explore this further or it's just a quick no. When, you're, when you have a deal come across your table, are you looking at it for, as the market first, uh, the tenancy first, or the building itself? What, what's kind of the order on how you will look at a deal? Yeah, I, I would say number one is the building itself. That's, that's going to be the first and foremost, the, the sort of harkening back to what I was saying before about the gen, generic nature of a building. Uh, if you make the assumption that the tenant, regardless of the tenant is or how good their covenant is, if you have to make the assumption there is the potential for them to not be there, uh, the day you close, what do you do with it? And if the building itself, if you don't love the underlying real estate, the building, then it's very difficult to even move on to the next, you know, sort of level of, of analysis. So I'd say you have to, you have to love the real estate itself. Uh, I think secondly would be market. And, and that doesn't mean that it has to be, you know, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver. It has to, the, the attributes of the investment have to match the market in which you are, you are, are participating in. So as long as you feel that the underwriting assumptions you're making are, are sufficient or are, are, um, are the right ones for that market, then you, know, you can you really open up the, the, the entire Canadian uh, marketplace to, to investment. Um, and I think the last would be tenant. I mean, obviously it's great to have a high quality tenant or a covenant, uh, you know, credit worthy tenant, um, but that's not the number one thing. Uh, I think if you want to invest on, on, on the credit C of the, or the, the, the strength of the tenant, I mean, that's kind of where you get into investing in, you know, in corporate bonds. When it comes to real estate, you know, the tenant is obviously the one who's paying you the rent, but in the event they're not, you want to be able to say that somebody else will be able to pay you the rent in that, in that space. So for us, uh, tenant is, is probably one of the lowest, it's definitely the lowest of those three. That's, that's really interesting. I, I think a lot of people would assume that the tenancy is actually the, the most important part on that. Uh, but if you're buying in a market that you like and you're buying a property that's resilient and can accommodate a number of different uses, you just have confidence in, in your team to be able to lease it to someone else if it comes up. So uh, that's really insightful. I appreciate your insight on that. Uh, so I, 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 that kind of leads into the next question that I had. And, and I know in your guys' portfolio, you have anywhere from a 79,000 square foot building to a 553,000 square foot portfolio of properties, which I think is 13 properties in that in that portfolio. And then you've got everything in between as well. When when you're looking at these deals, whether it's ones that you already own or whether it's ones that you're looking at, does the size make a difference if you're going from call it that 80,000 to 500,000 or are the fundamentals the same in every case? Yeah, I, I think the fundamentals don't change, regardless of it's kind of similar to the market. You know, whether you're looking at a five million person market or a half a million person market, the fundamentals stay the same. It's just how you treat it within within that market or within that that size of, of the investment. Um, so I think it you know, it also holds true. You've got to really like the underlying real estate. What does change when you get into different sizes is the different um, investment th thesis that you could have, uh, you know, with, with smaller buildings, there's the opportunity to potentially sell on a vacant basis to a, a end user, um, which becomes less possible as you get to be larger as the building gets larger. So there's, there's just different ways you can, you can analyze a potential uh, acquisition um, depending on its size that, that brings in different um, strategies in that might not work for a small building, but do work for a large portfolio of buildings. Uh, you know, whether it be economies of scale, for example, when you're talking about a, you know, a 13 building portfolio all in one area, uh, you start to look at it and say, well, there's, there's ways that we can potentially move tenants around and we can grow the tenants within our portfolio. So that's one of your strategies. And you might think about uh, acquiring neighboring properties to continue to increase the, the, you know, so the, the economies of scale within that market. And when it comes to a very small building, you know, we look at that and say, 
you know, we're okay if this tenant leaves. We'll be a little bit more aggressive on our rental assumptions because if they say it's too high and we're, we're out of here, you're okay because you think a user uses really different math when it comes to analyzing these things. A user might say, that's perfect for me because it fits my size requirement. And they're willing to pay on a, on a per square foot basis a much higher number than you would have gotten if you just capped an, an income, uh, a rent. So you guys have various funds within within Kingset, and uh, do you segregate deals based on whether they're stable cash flow properties with an existing tenant in place versus ones where there's value add where you could uh, potentially uh, add to the equation and have have a growth opportunity on that? Or how, how do you look at different deals? One being vacant with opportunity versus one having a long term tenant with existing cash flow. Yeah, I think it's exactly as you described it. It's the difference between what we call a core. Uh, opportunity, one that there's still something you can do to create value, but the, the the underlying thesis is not a value creation event. It's not something you're going to wait to do and say, well, a tenant's rolling or, you know, there's, um, you know, there's, there's uh, some excess land that you can build on. Um, those types of assets we look at in our growth fund. So it's a, it's, it's very active management. It's identifying an event. When that event happens, you take it to market, you sell it. So it's not a long-term hold. And what you're trying to do there is basically recycle the capital, go after the advantage, wait for the event or, or create the event and then sell. Uh, on, our, on our core strategy, it's more about long-term holds. So you, you're looking at, you know, not a, it's an evergreen fund, so it, it goes forever. Um, and you're not looking for a specific event. So you're just looking for a long-term deep value that, you know, 20 years from now, you're still going to want to own this building or at least this land in this location. <clears throat> and it's less about, uh, you know, a, a quick one time event that you're, that you're waiting for. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so I, I want to get your thoughts on, on what the market has in store. And, and I know nobody has a crystal ball, but uh, just to, to get your thoughts on, on how you see the future and shaping uh, first, first one that I'd really like to explore are interest rates uh, and, and interest rates of have been low for a while now. And we're also seeing a lot of monetary stimulus accompanying that. Uh, but at some point, we're going to have to see interest rates increase. And there's typically been a correlation between interest rates and cap rates. So do you see that that uh, link continuing on as, as interest rates go? Or are we just in a unique period of time in general? I think you'll always see cap rates and interest rates have a, have a relationship or correlation. Um, you know, cap rate... Now for us, we, we are less focused on the cap rate. A cap rate is really a, a way of measuring value at a moment in time. Uh, and you have to measure that against an, a, a risk-free uh, opportunity, which is, you know, which is like a, a bond with the government of Canada. So it's really your spread over or what interest rates are. So intuitively, if interest rates move up, then you, if you keep the spread the same, your overall cap rate has to move up as well. Uh, but when we invest, we don't look at cap rate compression or you know, where cap rates are going to be in the future. I mean, that's how we value our exit. What we would look at is, is actually growing the value of the property through, through income, through NOI growth. Um, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather cap a much higher income at a higher cap rate than just rely on, on cap rate compression to get my, my exit value. That, that works for me. So, you know, my, my view on interest rates is, you know, obviously we're at historic lows. We have been at historic lows for a very long time now. We've kind of gone from one crisis to the next and every time, you know, it was the it was the financial crisis, global financial crisis that uh, heralded the 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 you know the new low interest rate environment that that we found ourselves in and continue to find ourselves in. And just as we were kind of making our way out of that, and people were thinking, you know, inter- the, you know the 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 yield curve was starting to steepen, and people were looking in, at at locking in and and you know, hedging against the rising interest rates. Well, suddenly the global pandemic hits, and we're right back to where we were, you know, in the in the, in the dark days of the financial crisis. So we've spent the better part of, you know, 14 years trying to figure our way out of this low interest rate environment. So much to the, so to the fact that there's a whole generation of people now in, in, in this industry that don't know what a high interest rate environment looks like, or even how would you, how would you act within it? Uh, you know, they hear stories of their parents, you know, mortgages being 10% and it just seems ludicrous um, because we haven't seen that kind of thing in a very long time. Uh, will we see it again? I, it's, it's so hard to say. And I think trying to crystal ball where interest rates are going, you know, you've got to be a smarter person than I am to, to figure that out. But you just, if you focus on the things you can control, which is doing the right things for the real estate, doing the right things for your tenants, 
um, you know, ensuring that you're buying a resilient building in a resilient market, uh, you're going to do fine regardless of which way the interest rates move. Yeah, that, that's very well said. If you're buying on the fundamentals and you're comfortable with that property, whether interest rates are, are 2% or 8%, uh, and you're, you're buying with that, that concept in mind that you're comfortable regardless of what the interest rates are and you're only doing what you can control. I, th- I think that that's, that's very profound on that. Uh, I, I guess the corollary to interest rates is all this uh, stimulus, this money printing that's going on uh, all across the world. Every, every nation's printing money at a pace that, that's almost unfathomable, uh, but it's adding a lot to the money supply. Uh, and there's, there's speculation and theories out there that all this money supply could lead to massive inflation. I did an interview with uh, Peter Lineman uh, about a month ago, and he he thought that this amount of money, uh, stimulus would actually lead to asset value appreciation and inflation as opposed to necessarily consumer uh, inflation. So if that does happen, and, and, and again, none of us really have an answer on, on how this actually unfolds, but uh, do you see all this money supply adding to inflation or asset value inflation? Uh, and what does that potentially lead to building values and construction costs going forward? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would take the position that we're already seeing that, that we're in that right now. I think that's that started with the global financial crisis when they first started quantitative easing and, and printing a lot of money in the, the bond buying programs, uh, which just fueled the amount of, of, of capital available seeking yield. And hence, we've seen yields drop on pretty much all asset classes. And we're starting to see what people would describe here as, as some bubble type fundamentals uh, forming in not necessarily in real estate and maybe market to market it's different. But you're starting to see some very strange, uh, you know, the Bitcoin situation, the stock market situation. Uh, you know, you're seeing things like trading cards trading at all time highs. People are seeking a place to put the, the, the money that's being printed has to go someplace and, and seek yield somewhere. Um, and real estate is, is a great place to put it. But what I like about the, the real estate fundamentals is, you know, it's, it's less, it's less uh, emotionally driven and it's more practically driven. It's, it's actually things that you need within your economy to, uh, to operate. So will we see uh, inflation or asset value inflation in real estate? Absolutely, we will. and I think we are right now. Uh, but long-term, if you're buying the right real estate, once again, going back to, to what we're talking about with the interest rates, you know, if, if you feel that you know, we will continue to operate as a society, regardless of where inflation is or how much money's being printed, we will continue to you know, eat at restaurants or, or buy groceries, we will continue to buy clothing and, and, and need day-to-day things. This stuff has to move through the economy somewhere and somehow, and that's really through, through industrial real estate in, in, in this, you know, in this discussion, or in the case of, of multifamily, it's, you know, people do need a place to live. And, and with office, I mean, there's a lot of question around the work from home, but I, I think what we're seeing is that, you know, the work from home thing is a kind of a nice thing for a little while, but it's a, I think people have had it with that and there'll be a, <laughs> a desire to go back to the office. We're a little off topic, but I think what we're trying to say is that um, that asset value inflation, I would much rather be holding on to an industrial building or a multifamily building that's in an inflationary period than I would be holding on to a Bitcoin or a, or potentially a, an equity, which could have zero value because it's really on paper. Yeah, it's really interesting that you're even talking about the the sports cards. I had a friend that that just bought a a, a graded ten Connor McDavid card, uh, and, and it was it was really expensive. I was surprised at how much it cost. But when there's all this money getting flushed into the system, like you said, people are chasing yields, uh, and they're either finding that in in alternative investments like Bitcoin or sports cards, uh, or they're putting it into the stock market and chasing uh, rant meme stocks like uh, GameStop. Like it's it's a really it's a really interesting time right now with with all this money chasing different things. Uh, but I, I agree. I, I love industrial real estate as well, and and I'm optimistic uh, for the foreseeable future in that asset class. Uh, what what do you see going forward with with all that that we talked about? What what do you see in the the short to medium term for industrial? I think I mean I think we we're we we're just seeing the dawn of the sort of the industrial golden age. To be totally honest, I think with automation with uh, you know with the continuing um, resiliency in the supply chain as we mentioned before uh, with the shift towards e-commerce and and the shift towards uh, you know uh, you know things that are you know these meals ready to eat like the good foods of the world or, or whatnot where we have so many different ways that we can we can make our lives easier we can make our lives you know more connected and a lot of it comes through 
industrial real estate. And that's where, you know, all these things happen and come together. Um, and I think that what we're going to see is it's, it's an asset class that's been, you know, kind of overlooked for the most part uh, in the past. Um, you know, people really chase the big you know, trophy assets that, that look good on a brochure, like, a, you know, like an office tower or a, a regional mall or for the case may be, or a um, portfolio of, um, of apartments. I think industrial, you know, has really come into its own and it's going to continue. I just don't think, particularly in the Canadian context, where we are going to see, you know, continued population growth through migration, you know, the formation of households, the, the, the growing of, of the economy through the growing of our population dictates the requirement for stuff to come from point A to point B and, and, and to the end user. And you can't do that without industrial real estate. And as I mentioned before, the resiliency and the flexibility of the asset class is just going to make it more and more desirable for investors of all of all sizes, uh, from your small private investor who just wants to have something in their family trust, up to the large institutional investors uh, around the globe. And I think Canada, in particular, will will shine in this in this uh, in this asset class going forward. We haven't overbuilt. Uh, you know, we continue to have relatively low vacancy rates comparative to say other American cities of the same size as, uh, as a Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver. Uh, we have a relatively conservative investment uh, philosophy in Canada. So we don't tend to have a lot of over speculation. Um, and I think we have just good fundamental growth prospects going forward. And I think that's all going to do very well for industrial real estate. It's an asset class. I think everybody's taking a hard look at it now. I want to j just touch on one point that you made there about uh, it, it working well for investors of all sizes, uh, because I, I think there is that misconception uh, in industrial investing that it's largely institutional grade properties that that at least get all the news and that's what's talked about. But on the other end of the spectrum it could be smaller industrial condos or small uh, properties that the average investor could get into. So it kind of as a blanket statement, what, what would you say to someone that's considering investing in, in industrial real estate, whether they are are looking at that small property or whether they're trying to get something more institutional grade, what, what, what advice would you give to an investor right now? Yeah, I think stick to the fundamentals. At the end of the day, you're buying, you're buying a building and you're buying land that, that the building sits on. Uh, you're not buying, um, you know, a covenant, you're not buying uh, a process. What you, what you want to understand is, is the long-term prospects of, of the, of the assets you're looking at. Um, and I think, you know, where it sits within its market, understanding how that market functions from a transportation perspective, where the, you know, where rail terminals are, where, um, you know, highways are being built or are being improved. You know, these are the things that are going to dictate where tenants want to be. And if you can get ahead of some of the trends and some of the, you know, the, the, the plans that are, that are out there and find uh, opportunities, you know, in the path of, of development, in the path of, of, of infrastructure improvements, yeah, that's that's going to be a good investment for you, and and whether that be a a twenty thousand square foot industrial building, um, you know that 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 has decent clear heights or second generation, there's some you can you can work with an asset like that, or whether it's a a million square foot brand new you know forty foot clear building uh, you know in, in in Mississauga. I mean those are very different assets, but I think they're they're both assets that you know for the right investor can make uh, you know a very good investment that's that's secure yeah that, that, that that's great explanation so ultimately you're you're bullish on industrial and you see that being a, a viable uh asset class for the foreseeable future yeah absolutely yeah. i think uh, and i think it's it's it just comes down to the fact that we, we we need more of it we don't build it quickly enough um there's constraints whether it be land constraints uh whether it be uh you know governmental constraints through like things like the green belt and and uh development permits being held back or development charges being increased it has enough barriers to entry that i think if you can find the right asset that's existing and and, and able to generate cash flow from the first day you own it that's a, that's a good investment well, that, that's awesome. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to to give your thoughts on that, Matthew. That's uh, I got a lot of insight from myself, and I, I think people that are watching it will as well. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description to, uh, to Kingside Capital. I encourage people to go and check it out. And uh, thanks again, Matt. Really do appreciate your time. That's great. Thank you, Chad. Appreciate it. Thanks, Matthew. Take care.